Alex, and very glad to be here and to be getting to know uh, the group here. Uh, so indeed, I want to talk today about what we really know about the Wood Wide Web. Uh, some of you may know that the Wood Wide Web is a bit of a pun that was invented back in the late 1990s to refer to mycorrhizal networks um, among trees in the forest. And uh, I want to start uh, by saying that this talk was somewhat inspired by not just scientific literature, but in fact, uh, the point of this talk is somewhat to respond to a phenomenon that is happening uh, in the popular sphere uh, among uh, books and radio interviews and TV shows and forthcoming movies. Uh, and that is this idea that is being spread uh, through these media. Trees, they are just like us. And I will say a bit more about what that means in a minute. Uh, but this article by In Slate magazine a few months ago asked this question uh, about a recent run of bestsellers, best-selling books, promises that plants are people too. Are they getting ahead of the science was the question asked by the story. And the author was referring to, among others, uh, these books here, these very popular books. And my answer to this in short is yes, we are getting way ahead of the science. And I wanna talk today about what I mean by that. So first of all, I want to clarify what is being claimed. What do they mean that trees are just like people? Uh, the claims that you will see and hear on the radio and in these books include things like this. These are statements, these are quotes. Fungi connect trees and allow them to communicate and allow the forest to behave as if it's a single organism. Uh, massive below ground communications network. Mother trees nurture their young and reduce their own root competition to make elbow room in the understory. When mother trees are injured or dying, they also send messages of wisdom on to the next generation of seedlings. Um, so these are just quotes from uh, the TED Talk by Suzanne Samard that is very popular from the middle of 2016 on the topic of how trees talk to each other. So I've chosen these statements because uh, what I want to do is to walk through some of the evidence for these statements and to discuss what the science really says. Uh, so here's an outline of the talk. I want to start by talking hypothetically about the potential roles of common mycorrhizal networks in plant ecology. And I'm going to use this abbreviation CMN quite a bit to refer to common mycorrhizal networks. And those are networks of fungi connecting multiple trees in the soil. Second, I want to talk particularly about how to experimentally test for effects of CMNs on plant ecology. Third, I want to go through existing experiments. What do they tell us? And uh, examine the evidence, and then come to some conclusions about whether the story being told is accurate based on the science. So first of all, uh, I probably don't need to tell this group about what is the mycorrhizal symbiosis, but in case there are non-mycorrhizal people in the audience, this is a symbiosis uh, typically between plants and fungi where plants are transferring some amount of fixed carbon, uh, carbon compounds to fungi, and fungi are transferring some amount of soil nutrients and potentially other benefits and resources to plants. And this is often a mutualism where both species benefit from the interaction. Uh, uh, the type of symbiosis that I tend to focus on in my research is the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis, which is one example shown here between pines uh, and soil fungi, where the, the fungi colonize the roots and then they extend out into the soil uh, forming uh, a mycelium, uh, 
that can absorb nutrients very effectively from the soil around them. Uh, these fungi also produce diverse mushrooms, so many of the mushrooms we find in the forest are the fruiting bodies or sexual reproductive structures of these uh, fungi. So one thing that is true is that most mycorrhizal fungi are somewhat generalists, and by that I mean that they are capable of colonizing the roots of multiple plant species. And because of that characteristic, they have the potential to connect the roots of multiple trees, multiple trees of different species. And this is my cartoon. Uh, here you can see roots, and then the white threads are fungi colonizing the roots of both types of trees. This is a common mycorrhizal network shared between two trees. So we strongly suspect that common mycorrhizal networks are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. But a big question that still has not been adequately answered is whether these networks are important for plant ecology. Does it matter to plants that they are connected to other plants through these networks? And by asking this question, what I mean is, are there consequences of these networks for plants' physiology, for their growth, for their survival, for their competitive interactions with each other? Uh, there are, in fact, a wide range of opinions on this question. Uh, for example, my friend Marc-André Solas, uh, whom I'm visiting here in Paris, uh, and a, a group of colleagues published a paper on this topic in 2006 and argued that CMNs can have profound effects on plant communities. And at the other end of the spectrum, my dear friend Jim Beaver uh, made this argument in 2010 that there is nothing unique about CMNs and the term itself is actually misleading. Uh, and there are opinions all in between these as well. So what is Beaver talking about here? Uh, so the beaver perspective uh, comes back to plant soil feedbacks and population dynamics of plants and fungi. And uh, essentially uh, the argument here is that it's all in the population dynamics. Panicum, for example, as a plant has some effect on soil mycorrhizal fungi, Archaeospora, Acolospora, Scutellospora, and it has different effects on different species of fungi in the soil. And the result of that is differences in population dynamics, differences in abundance of those fungi. Panicum drives differences in abundance of these different fungal species. Similarly, Plantago affects these fungi in the soil and changes their population dynamics. The other direction is also true where these soil fungi have consequences for the population dynamics and abundances of these plants. And the whole system can be modeled with population dynamics, with Latka Volterra models. And there does not need to be any connections physically between the plants. The physical connections may be there, but it can all be modeled with population dynamics and so the physical connections are immaterial. They are unimportant. It's all just population dynamics. That is the beaver argument. Uh, they were also arguing that the evidence is weak for any unique effects of common mycorrhizal networks. There are essentially three hypotheses for how common mycorrhizal networks may have unique effects on plant ecology. Uh, one of those hypotheses is that there is some net flow of resources through the network from one plant to another. This may include carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, water, and even signaling molecules like hormones. A second hypothesis is that different plants may make unequal contributions of carbon to the network. So one plant might build the network while another plant might tap into it and benefit from the network without having contributed any carbon to build the network. 
this sort of asymmetry could be important. And then there could be asymmetry in the other direction uh, from the fungal perspective, unequal contributions of resources like nitrogen, phosphorus, and water by the fungus to one plant instead of another. All three of these are potentially interesting and unique effects of mycorrhizal networks on plant ecology. I would argue that numbers two and three actually can be explained and modeled quite well by the beaver uh, population dynamics approach. Uh, these kinds of unequal contributions may result in differences in biomass or population dynamics of the receiving organisms. But I would also argue that, in fact, hypothesis one cannot be explained by this uh, simple population dynamics approach because net flow of resources may be happening on a very different time scale than population dynamics. These flows of resources uh, can affect the physiology of plants and the growth of plants uh, on a different time scale than population dynamics are happening. Uh, and you could, of course, model this, but that kind of uh, indirect effect through resource flow is not modeled uh, adequately in current uh, plant soil feedback models. Uh, the Beaver paper, they argued that this net flow of resources here just had no evidence. So they were acknowledging that if this were common, it would represent a unique effect on plant ecology. Their argument, though, was that it doesn't happen. The, the, the evidence for net flow of resources is just very slim, very uh, minuscule. However, the problem... Uh, which I identified in uh, a book chapter in 2015, is that uh, the Beaver paper mainly focused on carbon. And that's perhaps because from the beginning of uh, our modern focus on mycorrhizal networks, there's been an overemphasis on carbon flow. And in fact, since uh, Suzanne Samard's important paper in the late 1990s, uh, there have been quite a few attempts to measure carbon flow through these networks, and they often find little evidence for carbon moving in, in important amounts through these networks. Uh, however, what the, the Beaver paper did not uh, focus on is that, in fact, there's quite a lot of evidence for nitrogen and water moving through these networks in large amounts. There are good experiments showing that water and nitrogen can move through mycorrhizal networks in substantial amounts, enough to affect the ecology of these plants. And so uh, that to me suggests that uh, it's much too early to dismiss uh, the potential for unique effects of mycorrhizal networks on plant ecology. And in fact, we need more focus on nitrogen and water and other resources besides carbon. And that's what I argued in that, uh, that book chapter. Um, so since then, uh, my current PhD student, Ian Mounts, uh, has been conducting a literature review of studies that uh, purport to test the effects of common mycorrhizal networks on resource transfer. And here is a graph of all the studies since 2015 48 studies that were in the laboratory, 18 field studies, and the types of resources that were studied by each of these, uh, these papers. And as you can see, there has been apparently a reduced focus on carbon in favor of other resources like nitrogen and phosphorus. On the y-axis here is the number of studies uh, examining the flows of these other resources. There are even more papers looking at hormones and signaling molecules moving through networks compared to carbon now. And I think that this is a good development because I think there's a lot more potential for interesting ecological effects of these other types of molecules. Uh, so I want to move now to going through a little bit how you would go about answering this question. So, okay, we can demonstrate potentially that resources move through uh, a network. And that has been done 
quite a bit. Okay, there are quite a few experiments showing, yes, there is some carbon that moves through this network. In fact, some of these papers have gotten a lot of publicity. Carbon moves from one plant to another through a network, or nitrogen moves through a network from one plant to another. But I would argue that if we really want to test if mycorrhizal networks have unique effects on plant-plant interactions, for example, or on plant ecology, we in fact need four criteria to be met. We need experiments that actually manipulate the presence or absence of the mycorrhizal network, and ideally isolating multiple different potential pathways in the soil from each other. These pathways include roots that can move resources. There is a pathway in the soil of bulk flow of water that can transfer resources. And then there is the fungus or the CMN pathway. And ultimately we need manipulative experiments that separate those pathways so that we can understand how much the fungal network actually participates in these resource transfers. We also need to measure the consequences for plants. So many of these experiments that look at resource transfer don't measure plant growth or plant physiology or survival or competition. These are measurements we need to understand if this resource transfer might be important ecologically. It's not, it's not enough to show that resources are moving from one plant to another. Those resources may not benefit those plants. It may just be incidental. It may be byproducts simply flowing down concentration gradients with no consequences for the plants. We need to know the consequences. Third, we need evidence in those same studies of the mechanism. We do need estimates of resource flow in the same studies that are measuring the consequences for plants. And finally, ideally, we also identify the fungi involved so that we have not only evidence for who are the fungi creating the network, but also to test for experimental artifacts. For example, to make sure that when we cut the network, we don't just change the fungal community. It could be that uh, the network treatment, the CMN treatment is confounded with changes in the fungal community. Okay, so how many papers have done all four of these things? I'll leave you to ponder that for a minute and then we'll come back to that at the end. Uh, so just a bit more on these pathways. So first of all, resources can flow through roots across space and end up very close to other plants where those resources could then be taken up by roots. And fungi do not need to be involved necessarily. But the other thing about roots is that Roots overlap with each other in the soil and they can have very competitive effects on each other. Plants compete with each other for nutrients and water in the soil and roots are the main organ uh, involved in that competition. So roots can have very negative effects of one plant on another. There is also the soil water pathway and then there's the mycorrhizal fungi pathway. Uh, and there are combinations of these pathways that may be important. For example, there could be a root soil root pathway. There could be resources that go from the to a fungus into the soil, back to the fungus, and then into the root of another plant. Or there could be root fungus root movement and that that is directly from a root to a fungus to a root. And that's really what we mean by a CMN transferring resources between plants is direct resource movement from the root pathway into a fungus and back to the root of another plant. Uh, how do we isolate these pathways? Uh, so uh, one key approach that has been used in many experiments is to use a mesh, a, a fabric or a stainless steel mesh that has uh, openings that are small enough to exclude roots, uh, to prevent roots, but large enough to allow fungi to grow through. And this is typically in the range of 30 to 40 or 50 micrometers or microns. And that's shown here. And this kind of mesh, if it's a single layer, allows the fungal pathway, but it also allows the soil pathway, the soil water pathway. It prevents 
and stops the roots from overlapping. Now, if you want to separate the soil and fungal pathways, you need to do something additional. Uh, so on the right here uh, is an example of a double mesh design where you have in blue is mesh that is small uh, enough to prevent roots. Now, how does this also prevent water uh, from flowing through the soil pathway? Well, there's an air gap in between. So the yellow here represents either a spacer, like another piece of fabric or mesh, uh, and it creates an air gap. And fungi can grow across the air gap, but water cannot flow across the air gap. And so a double mesh design with an air gap is necessary for eliminating that soil pathway and isolating the fungal pathway. So with that background, uh, I want to talk about, uh, focus on field experiments that have been, been done so far and talk about the methods employed uh, to date. So the first type of field experiment I want to describe uses what I'll call cylinders and soil cuts to manipulate the pathways. And what we have here is on the far left, we have a treatment that I'll call plus roots and plus CMNs. This is where a seedling is planted into the soil and it is allowed to be colonized by the mycorrhizal fun fungal network and the roots can overlap and there's a soil pathway. So all three pathways are here. This is what I sometimes call reality. That is how forests really work. Uh, a second treatment that can be applied in this context uh, is the second one here, which has no roots and no CMNs on this seedling. The seedling has mycorrhizal fungi, okay, but those fungi are not connected to the adult tree through a fungal pathway, or nor is there a root overlap. So there's no root pathway and no fungal pathway, only a soil pathway here. Uh, on the right, we have two more treatments involving a cylinder that looks like this. This is a cylinder with holes drilled in it and then wrapped in stainless steel mesh. And that mesh is about 40 microns in diameter. And on the far right here, if you plant a seedling into that cylinder and allow colonization, what will happen is that this seedling will connect uh, to the mycorrhizal network of the adult tree through the fungal pathway. And there will also be the soil and water pathway here, as there is in all of these treatments but there will not be root overlap. So this is no roots plus CMN. This treatment has the CMN, but no roots. And then for comparison here, we have a seedling planted in a, the same cylinder, except that the dotted line here, and I should have said over on the left too, this dotted line represents cutting the network with a knife or a shovel periodically. So it's severing, cutting it, cutting the roots, cutting the fungi. So this seedling here, its mycorrhizal fungi are free to explore this whole large volume. So in theory, this seedling has a large area to explore for nutrients. Its mycorrhizal fungi have plenty of access to resources, but it's not connected to the CMN. So this is an another no, no roots, no CMN treatment. And to, to test the pure effect of CMNs, or mycorrhizal network here, you compare these two treatments with the CMN and without in the absence of roots. There's a soil pathway in both as background. Uh, on the left here, we have the net effect of roots plus networks. And so here we might see if the root effect builds or adds on to the, the effect of CMNs or offsets it. Uh, and goes in the other direction. Okay. So the examples I'm aware of that have used this method, Michael Booth created this method in 2004. Uh, I used it with him in an experiment published in 2010. I have a student, uh, former student, and we're working on getting that paper published. Uh, and then there is also a 2016 paper by Brearley that used a similar method uh, as well. Um, 
Over on the far left, I wanted to remind you I'm calling that treatment reality. Uh, here's this example from Booth's original paper. This was really the first field experiment to test the effects of mycorrhizal networks on plant ecology. And what Michael found from his dissertation work was that overstory networks actually uh, decreased the survival of an arbuscular mycorrhizal tree. Interestingly, though, the network itself was an ectomycorrhizal network. So this was a, an ectomycorrhizal system and he planted this arbuscular mycorrhizal seedling, and it was negatively affected by uh, uh, interaction with that fungal network. But the ectomycorrhizal seedlings that were planted, which were Pinus strobus here, uh, benefited from their growth. Their growth was increased. And this was the first demonstration in the field that mycorrhizal networks could improve the performance of connected plants. Uh, we use the same approach in this experiment in a Pinus radiata forest on the west coast of the United States in California, uh, installing these cylinder treatments in a monodominant pine stand. And we found that there was a, a positive effect of CMNs on survival of the seedlings. Survival on the y-axis, time is on the x-axis, this is days. And then the CMN treatment is with the open circles and there was a higher survival rate, especially in the hot, dry summer. It's a Mediterranean climate with a very dry summer. And that's when we saw a big survival difference uh, between CMN plants and no CMN plants. Uh, and we actually looked at uh, carbon isotope evidence to try to understand the mechanism. Uh, and we found a difference between these treatments uh, where the CMN plants were actually more depleted in the foliar uh, carbon-13. This is actually in the opposite direction that you would expect if carbon was being transferred from overstory trees to understory seedlings through the network. Uh, if that were the case, it would be in the opposite pattern. This instead supports that those seedlings that were networked had a reduced water use efficiency, either from uh, uh, lower photosynthetic rates or higher uh, uh, water availability and, and transpiration rates. And in fact, we found that photosynthesis was the same and that there was evidence for higher availability of water for those networked plants. This evidence is indirect, but it suggests that the mechanism here of the survival benefit was enhanced water availability during the dry season for the network seedlings. Um, this, to my knowledge, is still the only field experiment that has found both a benefit of mycorrhizal networks for the growth or survival of a tree and uh, evidence for some kind of resource transfer through the mycorrhizal network. Uh, so uh, now I want to make another point though, which is that there was also a big difference in survival between plants that were affected, that were had access to adult tree roots and those that did not. So this graph here shows the difference between seedlings that were growing in the presence of roots and CMNs of overstory trees, and those that were growing in the absence of those. So the open squares are reality, and the black squares are when these seedlings were trenched and they were isolated from the adult trees. So ultimately, the adult trees had a negative effect on these seedlings. Their root competition was strong here, and it, it more than offset the benefits of the mycorrhizal network. So does this look to you like these adult trees are nurturing their young? Uh, I, to me, it does not, and it looks more like competition. Uh, the adult trees are having a negative competitive effect on their seedlings. The, yes, the mycorrhizal network is beneficial, but ultimately the root competition is stronger and offsets that beneficial effect. Okay, <clears throat> I want to mention a second major type of field study that is done 
This is a similar experimental design, except using mesh bags instead of cylinders. The far left, again, we have reality, which is no bag. Uh, the next treatment here is a mesh bag, but the mesh is very, very small. It's a 0.5 micron, half a micron. That is so small that fungi cannot grow through the mesh. So this isolates the seedling. Uh, it can be mycorrhizal, but it is not connected and there's no root overlap. Only there is a soil pathway, although that soil pathway may be cut off uh, because bulk water flow through 0.5 micron mesh is probably somewhat limited. Um, also, I want to point out that the fungi of the seedling cannot explore soil beyond the volume of that bag. Uh, on the far right, we have a no roots plus CMN treatment, which is again with a medium mesh, 35 to 40 micron mesh. This is very similar to the cylinder treatment I showed you before. So this treatment allows mycorrhizal network connections, but prevents uh, roots from overlapping. There is no equivalent in this experimental approach to this third treatment here, which is a, a, a bag control or a cylinder control. Uh, so there are quite a few examples of these kinds of experiments going back to 2005. I want to mention some of the pros and cons of these. Um, one of the benefits of the cylinder approach plus trenching is that the soil volume is less restricted in that no root, no CMN treatment. So here in the second treatment, if you go back to this diagram, this seedling here, the second one, has access to quite a lot larger soil volume to gather resources through its mycorrhizal fungi. Whereas here with the mesh bags, the volume that can be explored is limited to the size of the bag. And that may be important. On the other hand, the mesh bags are much easier to use, cheaper to construct, easier to install, uh, easier to maintain because there's not a separate uh, cut that needs to be made to maintain the treatment. Um, on the other hand, uh, the cylinder method is expensive and high maintenance. Uh, neither of these treatments is isolating the soil pathway from uh, the, the fungus or the root pathways. Um, I want to show you another example of an experiment. Uh, this is Bingham and Samard from 2012. It's one of the only other examples showing a positive effect of CMNs in a field experiment. Uh, there are a handful of others. This is the only one from the Samard lab that shows that CMNs are beneficial for plant growth or survival. This is survival on the y-axis, and there's a strong effect here of mycorrhizal networks. So the CMN effect is big. Plants with CMNs survived at a much higher rate. Uh, but two things here. Uh, one, is that carbon-13 did not vary among the mesh treatments here, so we're not sure of the mechanism. And second, uh, uh, the benefits of mycorrhizal networks here were off, offset by quite a lot by root effects. So again, the effect of roots was negative. And remember, on the far right, this, this is the reality treatment, plus roots, plus CMNs. Uh, and here, uh, there is a neutral effect of uh, this treatment. The other question is whether this beneficial effect of CMNs here is partly due to the restricted soil volume and therefore restricted water availability in this very dry system of the plants that are growing in this 0.5 micron mesh bag. Um, I want to introduce Briefly, a really cool experiment that was published just two years ago by Liang et al. in Nature Communications. Uh, this is the only experiment that has tested these questions in an arbuscular system. So all of the other field experiments so far are on ectomycorrhizal systems, ectomycorrhizal seedlings. Uh, they did both here. This is uh, six different species of seedlings, three of which are ecto in pink or red on the left, and three of which are arbuscular in blue. And on the y-axis, what you have is 
above zero is a benefit of mycorrhizal networks compared to uh, complete restriction of pathways, uh, 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 no roots, no CMNs. So above the line is benefit of mycorrhizal networks, below zero is a detrimental effect like this one here. Uh, interestingly here, I would say the take home message is that CMN effects on seedling growth were often neutral. The, there were many examples here. Uh, so what they did was they planted these six different seedlings in six different neighborhoods. Each seedling was planted into seedling into neighborhoods that were dominated by adults of all the different uh, tree species. And the effects were often neutral. In a lot of these cases, the seedlings did not benefit from being connected to mycorrhizal networks. And sometimes the effects were negative. Uh, they were much more positive. In, the ones in red are when they were planted next to conspecifics, next to the same tree species. Those effects were typically positive, but not always. So the effects of mycorrhizal networks were highly variable in this experiment, often positive, often neutral, and sometimes negative. And it also varied with ecto versus arbuscular and was more often positive for ecto than it was for arbuscular. In another experiment in the same paper, uh, they also compared simply uh, the survival of seedlings between networked 35 micron mesh and non-networked seedlings uh, 0.5 micron mesh. That's all these comparisons for uh, four different ecto species and four different arbuscular. And if you see the average pattern over on the right here, you can see that ecto mycorrhizal fun, uh, uh, seedlings benefit from these networks or benefited from these networks, whereas arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi did not. So it matters whether the plants are arbuscular versus ecto in how much they benefit from these mycorrhizal network connections. Okay, now I wanna come back to a bit of the media attention on this topic. Uh, here is a quote from a New York Times Magazine article from two years ago uh, that said, Samard has discovered that fungal threads link nearly every tree in a forest, even trees of different species. Uh, and carbon, water, nutrients, and alarm signals and hormones can pass from tree to tree through these subterranean circuits. Uh, here's a quote from Suzanne on the same topic. Yes, if one tree gets damaged by, say, mountain pine beetle, the injured seedling will up its defense enzymes. And then the receiving tree will then increase its defense enzymes because it knows now that there is some kind of damaging agent around. Uh, so I wanted to mention this because it mentions mountain pine beetles. Uh, and here is the only paper that I know of that have tested the effects of mycorrhizal networks on uh, responses of seedlings in the context of mountain pine beetle damage. This is uh, a paper from Justine Karst's lab uh, in, in mycorrhiza from two years ago. And this is a really interesting result, I think. On the y-axis is the effect of CMNs on survival of seedlings. And so above zero, again, is a benefit of mycorrhizal networks, and below zero is a detrimental effect. And you can see, again, there's a range from sometimes being a, a benefit and sometimes being a negative. But here on the x-axis is overstory tree mortality from pine beetles. So on the left is stands where there was uh, very little pine beetle damage, and that's where the mycorrhizal networks were most beneficial. But over on the right, and there was a lot of damage from mountain pine beetles, here's where seedlings did worse if they were connected to a mycorrhizal network. So this is kind of the opposite of what we would expect, I think, if those previous statements were true. In fact, here, damage from mountain pine beetles uh, doesn't seem to result in a signal that protects the seedlings through a mycorrhizal network. Kind of the opposite. Um, uh, and the mechanism here was not determined of these uh, changes uh, in response to the network. Okay, here's another quote from a very popular book. Uh, Peter Wollobin's book, The Hidden Life of Trees. Samard has discovered that trees also warn each other using chemical signals sent through fungal networks around their root tips, which operate no matter the weather. That six there is a citation, okay? So uh, this book has many citations in it of scientific papers. That's a citation of this paper, Song et al. in Scientific Reports from 2015. A very interesting paper 
uh, that has important results. But does it support this statement? Uh, tell me what you think after we talk about it. So this was a greenhouse experiment with a donor plant, Douglas fir, uh, and Pinus ponderosa as a recipient seedling in pots. Uh, they had the three mesh treatments, the reality, the 35 micron mesh with CMNs, and then the 0.5 micron mesh with neither of those pathways. Uh, they had three defoliation treatments, none, manual where they clipped the needles, and then they put budworms, uh, spruce budworms on the needles of some of the plants in a third treatment. And then they measured defense enzymes in the neighbor plants, uh, oxidative enzymes that are indicative of a defense response. And they found some intriguing patterns of these defense enzymes responding, especially to the manual defoliation treatment. Uh, here is one of the key results. Uh, and in fact, this is the only experiment I know of that has tested if mycorrhizal networks transmit defense signals in trees. It's the only experiment. This is a pot study. And what they found was, I, I'll interpret these um, bars for you, the tall bars here are a strong response of one of the enzymes, and those are in the 35 micron mesh treatments. So that's the, the CMN only treatment. Okay, so that's intriguing, and it's interesting why that stimulated the mycorrhizal network. But notice again that uh, all of the other bars are lower, including the reality bar, the reality treatment with roots. So in other words, there were elevated defense enzymes in the CMN treatment, but not in the, in the treatment with roots. So roots somehow were offsetting these effects. And remember, this is how forests really are. Real forests have roots. So this is, to me, not evidence that forests, uh, trees and forests are warning each other of insect damage so that network seedlings can protect themselves. This is an intriguing result that needs to be followed up, but there's a lot we don't know about how forests work when they are damaged by insects. Uh, this uh, paper also did not measure any subsequent consequences for these seedlings. So a key question is, these seedlings that had elevated enzymes, was that beneficial? Did that protect them from subsequent insect damage? And did that protection benefit the growth and survival of those plants? Uh, well, we don't, we don't know. And we need to know that before we make uh, big statements about how this is things, how things work in forests. Um, a third type of study I want to highlight, and I think this is a really cool study, um, used measurements of adult tree growth and compared that to mycorrhizal networks that were mapped in those same sites. And this is a really interesting result because what they found was that the growth of trees, of these big trees on the y-axis, was positively correlated with the number of mycorrhizal connections to other trees through the CMN on the x-axis. This was with rhizopogon. And this is the only evidence that I know of that shows that adult trees may benefit from mycorrhizal networks uh, in their growth or survival. It's correlative, and but it's definitely in the direction you would expect. Uh, but keep in mind, this is the only study that we on adult trees potentially benefiting from mycorrhizal network connections. So here's a summary of field studies on ectomycorrhizal trees in, in forest systems. As far as I know, there have been 16 field experiments published from 12 different papers that manipulated carbon common mycorrhizal networks and measured the performance, survival, or growth of tree seedlings. Of those 16, 10, indeed 10, found benefits for tree seedling growth or survival, but out of those 10 experiments, only one of them uh, determined the mechanism or had any evidence for a mechanism for how it works. We don't know in nine out of 10 examples, whether it was water or nitrogen or carbon or signaling molecules or some other factor. Uh, also, in many of these experiments, the benefits of CMNs were offset by negative root effects. Root competition is strong in these systems and often is bigger than mycorrhizal network effects. 
Uh, five of these experiments found negative effects of CMNs on seedling growth or survival, and none of those experiments determined the mechanism of those negative effects. We don't know if it was resource competition or something else. Only one field study that I know of has found evidence for benefits of CMNs to adult trees, and it was a, a it's correlative evidence uh, so far. And then finally, the only study I know of for the effects uh, of potentially showing that mycorrhizal networks uh, can help trees to warn each other uh, of insect damage was this one pot study and the phenomenon was only seen in the absence of roots. Okay, so that's what the experimental evidence tells us. Uh, so how do forest tree fungal networks really function then? First of all, I think the reality is more complex and interesting and poorly understood than what these popular books and radio interviews and forthcoming movies would have you believe. Uh, the effects of mother trees on seedlings through CMNs are often neutral or negative and not nurturing. Uh, CMN effects also depend on the neighborhood. Uh, who are the surrounding trees? Are they arbuscular? Are they ecto? What species are they? Root effects are often large and negative and larger than CMN effects. And we have very little evidence of any CMN mechanism in field studies, including warnings of insect damage. This, I think, is uh, an accurate summary of what we really know about how these networks function in the field. Uh, we don't know if CMNs are important for adult trees. There's some preliminary evidence, but that's it. Okay, that's where I will leave you. Uh, a few acknowledgments of my funding sources, uh, key collaborators, and uh, important field assistants in the experimental work that I mentioned. So thank you very much for your attention. And if there's time, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks a lot, Jason. <laughs> was very clear. And so now, so if there is a question, you can activate your microphone. Otherwise, I will start with a question. Well, I do have a question. Okay, uh, so yeah, go ahead. I did not raise my hand, sorry. No worry, <laughs> then there would be Marc-André and then Martin, but so go ahead. Yes, can you go back can into you your... Yep, yes. Yes. Uh, you, um, the bugs, the, the the insect attack. Sure. Let's see, can, can you see, is this the slide? One thank you. Here? Here. Okay. Yes, here. The, uh, as you said, you said that roots um, can have a negative effect. Uh, I don't really know how you said it already, but couldn't eat. Well, it's a bit unclear because this is a complex figure, but uh, the treatment with roots is, I believe it's this bar here and this one here uh, that have roots and they have roots and they have mycorrhizal networks. So the tall bars here with high enzyme activity have only mycorrhizal pathway and soil pathway, but no roots. But when you add the roots, it goes back down to the same level as you have with no roots and no mycorrhizal networks. So the roots bring it back down to this level down here. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, the three groups of bars here on the far left is, is no uh, manipulation. In the middle here is, is manual cutting of the leaves. And on the right, these this three th group of three bars here is uh, defoliation by the, the insect. I hope that answered your question. Okay, maybe there is another um, question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Marc-André, it's your turn. 
Oui, alors, uh, thank you a lot uh, for, for this uh, nice uh, survey and, and conclusions that I, I do support, especially the fact that popular literature was a bit positive on, or a bit fast on concluding. Uh, one thing is about the, the paper by uh, Susan Simard's team, the uh, Birch and collaborators from uh, 2020, where mm -hmm. they, they, they use the, the connection parameters by studying the, the population genetic or reusing an old study of population genetic of uh, rhizopogon. Yeah, uh, th th that's really a, a surprising paper because uh, we, we, it's correlative. And if you grow better, then you also send more carbon to the roots, then you have more roots to colonize and they are better fed and you are more connected. I mean, yeah. in which direction is it acting? I really hear, uh, I'm surprised that the paper is not more commenting that. Yeah, it's it's an important point that you make, Marc-Andre, and I agree. It's correlative and it could be going either direction. And uh, I make this point, I, I think it's an important paper because it involves adult trees and it's very difficult, as you know, to work with trees and to find any way to try to answer these questions for adult trees. And so I applaud the effort to try to do this kind of analysis, but it is very important to recognize that it's a correlation and it could be going in the other direction, just like you say. And so I also want to make that point that we really don't know that adult trees are benefiting from mycorrhizal networks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I share this view indeed, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah, if Mac andre is done, Martin, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, very, very surprising. Uh, I mean, I, the style of the, of the talk was very surprising. Uh, I wanted to... Maybe I missed something. What is the negative effect of the root? And does it connect to the age of the root or of the plant? Mm. Uh, yeah, a good question. I don't know for sure the mechanism of the root effect, but I think it's probably resource competition. Uh, these are systems with very poor soils very dry, very low in nutrient availability in most cases, and roots are competing with each other for those limited soil resources. And I think it's simply, probably simply resource competition, uh, but we don't have much evidence to uh, definitively say what, the, what that mechanism is. Thank you. And an another question, if I may? Uh, uh, is it possible to do some, uh, uh, to add some mycorrhizae to the, to, the, to the soil uh, and to see the, if there is an effect uh, where, I mean, if there is an improvement in the growth of the plant or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, it is, and do, that, I, yeah, that kind of test has been done many times in forestry. Uh, in nurseries to see if uh, mycorrhizal inoculation can improve the performance of seedlings. And in some cases, it definitely does. Uh, uh, it, it depends, though, on the context. So if you plant uh, a seedling in a field in an open clear cut near a forest of that same species, there will probably be enough spores and other inoculum in the soil that uh, that seedling will quickly become ectomycorrhizal. But different species of ectomycorrhizal fungi may be more beneficial than others, and so it may be helpful to inoculate with a particularly beneficial uh, tree, I mean a, a fungus. But compared to the normal practices of, of foresters, it, it's very expensive and time consuming to do this inoculation. And so in many cases, my understanding is that they have decided it's not worth the cost, uh, but that's still being explored. Uh, there are some people arguing strongly on both sides and 
Uh, you will find some practitioners are using these mycorrhizal inoculations and others are not. Uh, also, we have some evidence from meta-analysis showing that it matters where the inoculum comes from. So if you get the fungi from that same site and it's a local fungus, that is more beneficial than if you use a commercial inoculum that uses fungi from another system. Thank, thank you, thank you for your answer. Yeah, Marc Henri, it's your turn again. Marc Andre, you raised your hand. Voilà. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say that in France, we we have a, a production of Douglas fir, Pseudotsuga mantisi, inoculated. Uh, it was my thesis, indeed, to to look for survival of the strain mm -hmm. after transplantation to the field and to effects on growth. It's true that there is a tremendous effect because at ten years you have a, a, the inoculation is producing a, a ten percent high increase, which means a fifty percent wood uh, mass, biomass increase, which is quite strong. But uh, as you say, the, the, the seedlings are much more expensive. So this use, their use is very limited by that because mm -hmm. the, the money available in forestry uh, is not so high that people can afford a, a seedling that is uh, nearly twice more expensive. Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that you worked on that. Uh... By its prehistory, it was in the 90s. Hmm. Okay, right. Is there any other questions? So, otherwise, um, so I, I have a question, but it might be too specific. So, in the first experiment you were presenting, you were talking about so um, nitrogen or carbon flux. Um, I was wondering in this kind of experiment, um, what were the how the measurements were done, or how do you measure carbon and so on? Because I'm interested mm -hmm. in doing it in over ecosystem, and so in mm -hmm. this experiment, uh, do you have in mind how how it's done? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there are a few different approaches that can be used. Uh, an innovative approach that Suzanne Samard used in her uh phd dissertation work in uh, published in a nature paper in 1998 was to use two different tree species and then one of them was labeled with radioactive carbon carbon 14 the other one was was labeled with a heavy dose of carbon 13 the stable isotope and then that allowed for looking for the reciprocal movements of carbon from one plant to another and that was the innovative technique that she used to to show that the movement was bi-directional, but that it was sometimes stronger in one direction and sometimes stronger in the other direction. That was the exciting aspect of that uh, paper. And, and so she was using a Geiger counter to uh, uh, estimate flows of the, carb of the uh, radioactive isotope. Um, and then you have to have very deep, careful models of, of these isotopes and their partitioning at different steps uh, to understand what the expectation is uh, based on the, the labeling and where the carbon ends up. Um, the, as I also uh, discussed, one, uh, so radioactive carbon is um, an option, but it's also difficult to use because there's uh, more of a safety problem, uh, getting permits and equipment, et cetera. Stable isotopes are easier. Um, you can either label with them and do sort of a pulse or you can just try to rely on natural abundances uh, because there is some partitioning and expect uh, that you might expect depending on the pathways of carbon in the system. And so, um, uh, for example, uh, you would expect uh, overstory trees to have a different carbon-13 signature in their photosynthates uh, than understory trees. Uh, and that uh, can potentially give you a signal uh, uh, that you would see in the seedlings just by analyzing the stable isotope content of the seedlings. But the problem is that that can also be affected by, uh, you know, how much the stomata of the seedlings are open and by water availability. And so that's, it's tough to rely on only stable isotopes in that case. But I still think it has the potential to give you some value. Um, potentially powerful is to couple that approach with stable isotopes of oxygen 
uh, and deuterium which uh, in water samples, which would help you to understand the source of the water. So groundwater from, from deep underneath the trees typically has a different uh, uh, water isotope signature than water coming from rainfall versus water coming from fog. Uh, and those three sources can contribute to a different signal in the seedlings, depending on where they're getting their water. So if a seedling is getting water through a mycorrhizal network, you might expect that that water was coming from deep groundwater because often what is what is hypothesized is that trees are lifting groundwater through a hydraulic lift from deep soil up to the surface and then redistributing that water uh, through the soil around the roots. Uh, we think that that's probably what happened in the 2010 experiment. And the fungal network may promote that redistribution of water which you would expect then to result in a different um, isotope signature for the water. Uh, nitrogen, also stable isotopes of nitrogen, just their natural abundance may also tell you about the sources of nitrogen. So that's one approach as well. Uh, so if for field studies, those are probably the best options, but uh, if other people have ideas, I, I would be interested to hear them. Okay, uh, no problem. It's just um, I'm more interested in general in microbial communities uh, from yeah, the ocean, for instance. And I was wondering yeah, if um, if the techniques were the same because it's not yeah, the same mm -hmm. object and so on. But uh, no, that's quite clear uh, to me now how you are working on. And uh, so I've got two other questions. If yeah, nobody has uh, raised the end, so <laughs> I keep on. Uh, asking them, so um, you say that so in fact this interaction they are certainly spe um, species specific. It depends um, who are the actors and so on. But so there is uh, right now there is no idea or quantification if, for instance, between uh, phylogenetically uh, closely related trees there is more um, communications or uh, yeah um, mutualisms or competitions. There is no quantification at this point. We are not studying enough different species to to have this kind of ideas. Mm. Yeah, probably not yet. I think that we need more studies that are spread across the phylogeny of plants and across the phylogeny of fungi uh, to really answer that question. I think the closest is uh, the recent papers by Liang who are really starting to uh, do these experiments with several different kinds of ectomycorrhizal trees and several different species of arbuscular mycorrhizal trees. If more of those experiments start to accumulate, I think a, that kind of phylogenetic analysis would be uh, informative and really interesting. Uh, in the mapping of the fungal networks so far also, it's just a few uh, fungal species. Uh, and so we, you know, Rhizopogon was, is the subject of the Byler papers uh, that I that I mentioned earlier. And uh, Rhizopogon is a specialist on, on conifers and pines. And um, we need to know also what does the network look like for other kinds of fungi. And so we need more studies on diverse taxonomic groups. Yeah. All right. And so the last one. So at the end, you say that finally, you don't know if uh, semen are important or not for adults. So does it mean that they are important, they might be important at the beginning uh, when it's young trees and so on. And then, so the relation, um, competition or mutualism is really, it, it doesn't care anymore at the end. It's really changing uh, with the stage and the age uh, of, uh, of the trees. It was not yeah. just uh, for me, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be how it works. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's very difficult to do experiments on adult trees. And so all of these experiments, when we have measurements of plant performance, of growth or survival, uh, it's always on seedlings. And so all the evidence we have is for seedlings. So really for adults, it's just an unknown. Uh, it certainly could be the case that there are more benefits for seedlings, and that would make some sense. There are hypotheses going back to uh, Newman's paper in the 80s that uh, 
hypothesizing that seedlings may benefit more from mycorrhizal networks because the adult trees are the ones that are feeding the network with, with sugars. The carbon to build these networks is coming from big trees. And then all the seedlings have to do is to tap into that network by growing their roots and connecting to it. So it's a free lunch. It's a, it's a, a free network for the seedlings. And so any benefit, uh, they didn't have to pay anything for it. So that's one way that seedlings could benefit. The trees, meanwhile, are the ones paying the cost to build the network. But for trees, on the other hand, maybe carbon is cheap. Maybe it's uh, sugars are, are uh, byproducts and, and plenty abundant for trees and they can just uh, throw it around and building a fungal network is not a big cost. So uh, we don't really know. All right, great. And Florent, you wanted to... Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, Jason, for this fascinating talk. Um, of course, um, most of these studies, they focus on the benefits for the plants. And uh, I wonder if um, there are studies going on uh, where the, the benefits for a fungus is measured. I mean, the benefits for a fungus to interact with different hosts of same of different species. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so certainly I've taken a very plant centric perspective at this talk. Uh, and if you, you talk to my friend Toby Kears about mycorrhizal networks, um, she will argue that we need a much more fungal perspective on these networks. And in fact, the fungi may be the hubs from this perspective. They may be the points in the network and the trees are connecting the fungi to each other. And uh, that's a valid perspective and you can analyze these networks from both of those perspectives. Um, in terms of measuring the benefits, uh, so in the field studies, I am not aware of, of any uh, attempt to measure benefits of these networks for the fungi themselves. Um, in laboratory studies, there are some uh, approaches that are kind of doing that. Um, the Kears lab has some very nice experiments showing that, uh, uh, you know, fungi that are more generous as mutualists potentially are, are rewarded by, by plants uh, with more carbon. But on the other hand, also, uh, uh, and so, so two fungi that are connected by a plant um, may differ in, the, in what they receive from that plant. Uh, and so that would be perceived as uh, one fungus benefiting more from that plant network than the other fungus. And so some of Toby Kears' work with our buscular mycorrhizal plants in the lab are probably some of the best evidence for that. Um, also, th there are some papers trying to measure the just the reciprocal benefits going back and forth between plants and fungi, uh, but not really in a network context. Uh, we will have a paper coming out soon uh, from that perspective. But yeah, to answer your question, I guess, is that there's very, very little uh, tackling the question from that perspective. All right. Um, OK, so I guess Florent is satisfied with it. And yeah, I think there is no more questions. So I will thank you again, Jason. I hope uh, it was all right, yeah, and not too, you are not too tired now, and that you will have energy to, <laughs> to continue your visit in Paris. Thank you. Uh, it's very energizing to be here, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Yeah, even by video. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, Jason. Have a nice, uh, have okay. a nice stay in Paris. Et merci. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup.